right, sure. Okay. Right. So, so we're just looking at um, you know Second Corinthians. Um, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, Second Corinthians nine. So, which which kind of spells out. Okay, this should be the heart posture of the giver, um, and we know that it's part of our lifestyle of worship. So, if we were to do that, we know that we can worship in a ritualistic manner. Right. Our heart need not be there. We can do it. We can go through the motions of worship and not really engage. And that's what the Lord says. You know, these people draw near to me with their mouth, but their heart is far away. The Lord Jesus says, right? which means that they're doing the right things. They're saying the right things. It all sounds good, but deep inside the life and their, you know, their inner life, that's not really engaged. It's a very superficial thing. It's a very outward thing uh, in inwardly. They are actually far away. They are distant, right? And and so, even when it comes to giving or acts of kindness, our motives could be different. Or you know, we we may not be necessarily engaged in our heart um, in doing the heart with God. So that's why you know this is a very liberating passage when it comes to giving. It's a very liberating passage. It just frees us up from the expectation of man. It frees us up even from our own. You know, um, understanding of God, or wrong understanding of God, or fear of God, uh, or you know, unnecessary expectation that we put pressure that we put uh, upon ourselves, right? So it just frees us. It's, God says, hey, you choose whatever you purpose, you do it, but you do it, you know, willingly. You do it, you know, um, cheerfully, and uh, and that's it. It's it's from a place of relationship, right? So. So that's something that uh, literally liberates us. Okay, um, yeah. So let's look at one more verse, which is in James chapter one and verse twenty-seven. So it says, "Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this: to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world." Okay? And many such scriptures that we see in the Old Testament. Uh, Isaiah chapter one verse seventeen, like learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow, right? To to do this, to seek justice, to defend the those who are without any defense, who do who can't defend themselves, to take up the cause of those who are downtrodden, right? So, to be a voice, voice of truth, voice of um, voice of help. That's something that is from God. You know, that is close to the heart of God. That is the heart of God because He is the God of righteousness and justice, right? So, so the thing is to do it the right way. You know, that is something that's that we need to. Maybe that's another discussion itself. That we need to do it in an honorable way. We need to do it in a right way, and in a way that, like. What we read in Psalm 23, it says, "He leads me in paths of righteousness." So, even in this defense, even in this bringing out justice, even in being a voice to the voiceless, right? How God would lead us is in leads of, uh, in paths of righteousness, right? So, right steps and right ways, uh, and so on. So, it might not be the easiest of paths. It might not be the easiest of decisions. Right? It is definitely something that is going to make us. Uncomfortable, stretch our faith, and so on. But we can be sure that God leads us in paths of righteousness for His own name's sake, right? So, so all this would, when we make it a part of our lifestyle, a lifestyle of worship, there's something that is involved there, which is sacrifice. Okay, sacrifice. So we know we were looking at how the priests, you know, would bring the sacrifice. To God, and how when we release words of gratitude and praise, those are also sacrifices that come before God. But when we're looking at sacrifice, we're looking at it as something that we need to give up. Right? A sacrifice is this. You know, when you, you say, "I sacrificed my comfort," "I sacrificed my time," "I sacrificed," you know, something that I could have done, but I. I sacrifice it. What does it mean? That means you gave up, willingly give up, right? So there is this element of sacrifice when it comes to a lifestyle of worship, right? 
so we should not be surprised right? we should not be you know saying oh, i didn't know that this would be there yeah in serving god we know that in being a witness for god in being a, a voice for a voice of truth right there is that aspect of sacrifice to give up something that you have a right to right? you have a right to maybe you know your time you have a right to maybe sleep in late whatever you have a right to it but you give up that willingly and that's a sacrifice why do you do that because of the cause right because of the cause you know you want to help someone you want to you know uh, be generous with so, so when when you say generosity you are actually sacrificing you are giving up your life you're giving up your time you're giving up your resources right you're giving up certain things that you could have you know spent elsewhere uh, or you know how you, you could have lived a very different kind of life but you sacrifice it right you give that up in order to do this do what god wants you to do so it's it's it has this whole thing of giving up right the second thing is also to take on right so which means you give up something willingly but you also take on something willingly which means you take on a responsibility maybe right you take on a task that requires your attention your time right you take on certain responsibilities so sacrifice has these both aspects you give up and you also take on some things right um this one second So you give up and you take on. Uh, sacrifice also, you know, means that you put to death. Now, that's what it means, right? When you when there's an animal which is brought and as a sacrifice, it is put to death. So there is a dying that happens figuratively to us, a dying to comfort, a dying to the demands of the flesh, a dying that happens. Right? So sacrifice. When we say sacrifice, we're saying giving up something willingly. taking on something you know that you don't have to but you take it on upon yourself to do it right maybe a task maybe a responsibility right something that you do um, you take take it upon yourself right to do it and it also means there is a there is a dying right? there's a death to fleshly desires there is a dying to certain things that just rise up within us you know maybe um maybe pride maybe anger maybe you know whatever there is a dying that happens and it becomes a sacrifice um yes shani hello so oh, i don't understand what when you what you talk about when it says there is an element of sacrifice when it comes to worship can you explain that please yeah so when it comes to so we are looking at lifestyle of worship right so we're saying that a lifestyle of worship and we are talking about how uh good works gender generosity um and also acts of kindness and all these things uh, like we saw that verse hebrews 13 verse 16 it says that this is th with these sacrifices god is well pleased right so saying that okay this is a lifestyle of worship this is a something that needs to be part of our life in how we live our life so when we say okay i want to live a lifestyle of worship and i'm going to you know be generous with my time or being generous with uh my resources uh in order to help people in order to be you know share uh, with people be kind to people it involves a sacrifice so it involves giving up something so which means we need to be aware of the fact that hey this is something that is inbuilt into this lifestyle of worship and so it doesn't take me by surprise i'm also aware of it and i'm willing so i count the cost and i say okay i'm willing to do that so so some specifics on sacrifice it means giving up something that you have a right to uh, it also means you take on something that you don't have to necessarily have to but you take it on right and also it's it's a kind of dying it's a kind of bringing to an end certain things in us dying to the flesh dying to certain you know certain rights and privileges you you die to that in order to live this kind of a lifestyle of worship does it make sense yes i think i understand so what you're saying like on page 39 when you were saying about being kind to others 
um, yeah. speaking of truth edifying, that's kind of like living a lifestyle of, um, that's that's what you mean by terms of living a lifestyle of worship. Am I correct? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so we, we looked at, uh, you know, you know uh, a life that involves giving uh, and God loves a cheerful giver and, uh, and so on. So the second thing that we see is that uh, the choices that we make, you know, which is in line with dying to ourselves or dying to putting to death, you know, the things of the flesh. Um, the second thing is also a life of consecration. Okay, so what is consecration? Setting ourselves apart. Right? Setting ourselves apart for God's use, right? So you're making a choice. You're setting yourself apart and saying, okay, I'm going to live this way for God. Right? So you can live you know, thousands of ways. There's a, so many of so much of choices, but not everything is right. Not everything is useful, right? And so you're saying, okay, this is how I want to live for God. You're consecrating yourself according to the Word of God, according to the path of righteousness. Saying, say, I want to live a holy life. I want to live a life of consecration. Okay. So in line with that, let's look at Romans 12. Okay, Romans 12 verse one. Okay, it says. Can somebody read that? Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Yeah, you can use the mic probably. Yeah, so you have it, the Romans 12. Somebody read it. Mic's not Therefore, I urge you, brother and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to god this is this is your true and proper worship do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what god's will is his good pleasing and perfect will right thank you so verse 1 and 2 romans 12 it talks about how we are called to present our bodies. Okay, present means just give our bodies, bring ourselves to God, the members on our body, to God as a what? As a living sacrifice. So, which means that present continuous, you know, as you continue to live, you are continuing to sacrifice, continuing to present yourself to God. And it's like a living sacrifice, an act of living sacrifice, a lifestyle of sacrifice okay so this involves it's saying holy acceptable to god you present yourself your members your body uh holy and acceptable to god okay so which means whatever choices you are making you know, your members talking about the parts of your body uh, members talking about what goes on your mind the acts that you do everything is saying you present as a living sacrifice it's ongoing ongoing things not just okay at that retreat you know at that time at that altar call or at that moment yeah i presented myself to god no saying you know the way you live your life 24 hours every day right you present continue to present your body as a living sacrifice now here's the thing you know uh, a sacrifice when once once that body is dead doesn't feel any pain but then as a living sacrifice it's it's a continuing thing, and there is that certain amount of pain and discomfort, right? Because you're making a choice. You're saying, you know, I'm, you're putting to death certain aspects of your life, right? So he's saying you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, and this is the this is what this is how you're presenting that so that it is holy, so that it is acceptable to God. So who decides that? What is holy and acceptable to Him? Sorry, God decides. And how do we know that? How do we come to that understanding? By the renewing of our mind. Because it says in verse 12, don't be conformed. Okay, so that's the first thing. Don't be con what does conform mean? Right? Don't fit in. Right? Don't fit in. It's like uh, you know, if you if you played with mud and sand and clay, you know, we we took some like a soap box or something, and we took that clay and we filled it, right? We filled with it. And then we put it out, wet sand, it, it retained that shape. And we filled something else with some other shape, and we filled it, and then it retained that shape, and we played with it. Now, what happens? Like it, it fits the pattern of the mold. 
right? Whatever mold it is, it's a square thing, it gives that shape. If it's a circular thing, ball-like thing, it gives that shape. So here, Scripture is saying, don't fit in. Right? Don't be conformed. And I think that, that version that we read, fit into the pattern of the world. Right? When it says world, it talks about the way of living, whatever is esteemed highly by the world, um, which, is, which contradicts the word of God. You know, some of the values, some of the thought patterns, some of the things that the world esteems, which is in direct conflict with the truth of God's word. Right? Well, hard work, if it's esteemed, do we not conform to it? No, it is, it is in line with the truth. Right? Excellence and hard work and so on. So, it's talking about things that are in conflict with the truth of God's word. Okay. So when it says don't conform to the world, that is what it means. So it says don't conform to the pattern of the world, the values of the world, this world system of doing things, but be transformed. Okay. Be transformed, be changed, change radically by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. So as we renew our mind, what is renewing the mind? mean mm. to remove thoughts that is of the world mm. Mm. right so two things you said you know to let go and to fill in right to let go of and to take on so so both has to happen simultaneously. So when we encounter truth, we let go of lies. We encounter, you know, that uh, this is what the Word of God says about me, about my life, about God, about people. So whatever wrong ideas that I've had, or whatever ideas that I've had, which are in conflict with the Word of God, I let go of it and say, hey, this is what the Word says. You know, I have ideas of revenge. This is what the Word says. I let go of it. Right? So we take on the truth of God's word. We let go of the lies, deceptions, everything that is exposed by the word of God, exposed and brought to life by the light by the word of God. We let go of and we take on the truth of God's word. So therefore, our mind is made new. Our th when you say mind, our thinking is made new. Our desires are made new. Our uh, you know, our imaginations are made new, right? It's no more futile, empty, but it's life-giving. So what results? You know, as a result of this mind being made new, our thinking, pattern, thoughts, imaginations, everything is made new. So that results in transformation. Transformation of our conversation, transformation of the way we choose certain things, make choices. Everything becomes transformed. Right. So that's what the Word of God is saying. You know, be transformed, be changed by the renewing or making new renovation of your repairing and everything of your mind. And you present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. So it's saying when you live a life of consecration, when you make, you know, for example, you know, you make a choice, okay, I'm not going to do this. Right? Or I'm going to give up this. It's an act of worship. Right. says the you know offer as a living sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So it's an actual you know which is a uh, which is a sacrifice and and it's a it's an act of worship. Right. So when we look at it that way, when we make those hard decisions, when we make those choices uh, to live a life that is holy, to live a life that is consecrated, that's an act of worship to God. Right. So. It, it becomes part of your life. It becomes a lifestyle of worship. Uh, several other verses which talk about our body being a temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, 1 Corinthians 6 talks about that. Verses 19 and 10, you know, verse 20, it says, Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, dwelling place, abiding place of the Holy Spirit. Your body, our bodies. Right? So it's so personal, and yet we see that the God of heaven and earth, the Holy Spirit, he indwells us. Right? So our body is the abiding place or the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, which is, you know, which as a revelation, when we get it, it's, it's mind-blowing. Right? You think of God, the, this Holy Spirit who was there at creation, the same Holy Spirit 
actually comes in and dwells in us. Right now, he is dwelling in us. Right? So Paul is reminding the Corinthian church, hey, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you glorify God in your body. So don't do anything contrary to bring honor and you know dishonor, to bring dishonor and shame to God uh, by the works, by the expression of what you do through your bodies, right? So glorify God. I'm sorry, glorify God in your body because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? So everyday choices. When we say yes to God, when we no, say no to sin, when we say no to the things of the flesh, right? We are actually putting to death. It is a sacrifice. And it is an act of consecration. You're separating yourself. Right? So when we say consecration, it doesn't mean isolation. We need to understand that. Right? Many times we think, if I was not in this place, if I was not in this city, if I was not in this college, if I was not living with these kind of people, you know, I'll live a much better life. Well, they might, that, there is some truth to it in the sense the Bible talks about the fact that evil company corrupts good habits, right? So there is a there is a truth to it in the sense you're fellowshipping and you're having this close association, uh, you know, with that kind of company, and it's going to influence you, right? But then the fact is that consecration is something that you live in the midst of people, live out in the midst of people, live out in the in that environment where we are, right? Because we are called to be salt and light we are called to be the influencers right and not let the world influence us right we are called to come to that place of strength so that we can live a life of consecration and be a life of uh, live a life of influence right okay one more one more verse romans chapter 6 okay romans chapter 6 verse 13 and 14 says um yeah and do not Present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. Okay, so there is a do not there. Um, don't do this. But present yourselves to God. You now, here again, we see, you know, you present yourself to God, which means you give yourself to God. Um, the report for duty, in other words, you present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. To God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. So when it says members, you know, our all our physical senses, seeing, what seeing, hearing, everything, speaking, all our you know uh, physical senses, members. Um, so our choices involving our physical senses. Think about that. He said, present yourself to God. Our choices involving our physical senses, our, you know, uh, our organs of perception, touch, feel, taste, see, hear, everything. Our choices involving that says, you present yourselves to God as being alive from the mid, alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness. You know, that word, the instrument of righteousness, actually means weapon. You present your members as a weapon of righteousness to God, not a weapon of destruction, right? As we not a weapon of unrighteousness, but as a weapon of righteousness to God, as instruments of righteousness to God. Okay, so which means, don't put yourself in the line of fire, don't expose yourself, don't make yourself vulnerable unnecessarily. Right? Already we know that we are in a spiritual battle. That there are, you know, weapons formed against us. There is our our own unrenewed flesh, which you know, which which needs to be put to death. So, do not put yourself in a place of vulnerability. Okay. Sometimes we think, right? How close I can I get to the fire without getting burnt? And right? how close can I get to the edge of the cliff without falling over? You all say that, you know? How close? Still, it is it's still right, you know. How close can I can I do that? Because we just want to you know play with fire. How close can I go, and then not get burnt or no, no damage is done? Uh, praise God, I'm still you know I'm still in the right. right? And your but your conscience is telling you um, 
Yeah. Yes, Annie. Yeah, I just want to make sure that I'm, that I'm understanding. So I, I think I'm understanding it more and more that you're talking about it. So in terms of um, sacrifice, like going back to the example, when you say that kind words and edification, um, when you want to speak kind words to somebody, if they say something to you, instead of going off on them, you're saying kind words. So that's like sacrifice and giving up and kind of being and saying kind words to them is kind of an example of taking um, on something. Is that, is that what I'm kind of hearing, what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Right. And, yeah. and this, Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so, and so, yeah, that is it about the sacrifice. But then uh, we are also talking about uh, living a life of consecration, which means a continued life of making righteous choices, uh, choices for good. And that is what we are talking about. The second thing, right? Okay. So, yeah. So, which is an act of worship to God, which is also a sacrifice, right? So, um, so it is a life of sacrifice because you're sacrificing something. Uh, you're making a choice, and it's like the Romans 12 says, you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Right? So you're making those choices, you're renewing your mind, and you're letting go of certain things which you might have a right to, and it is a, a, it's, it's a life of a living sacrifice. So that is what we are talking about. Okay, and the second question I had in terms of our bodies are the tip of the Holy Spirit. So I have a question about this. So if, if is, is having... Um, sex outside of marriage, if you're not married, is that considered a sin? I know it speaks in the Bible, but I just want to know if that considered a sin. And then my last question is that when you spoke in terms of Romans 6, 13 or 14, it says members as instruments. Did you mean, did you mean senses? Is that what you meant by that? So those are my last two questions. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think the first question is definitely, uh, yeah, it's, it's the Bible very, very clearly talks about it. And if you want to go through that list, of the works of the flesh, you can go to Galatians chapter five, um, and um, which verse is that? Galatians five and uh, talks about the works of the flesh. Um, just before talking about, yeah, right from you know verse sixteen onwards, it talks about uh, how the flesh lusts against the spirit and so on. And there's a whole list that is there. You know, verse nineteen onwards, uh, sex outside of marriage. Uh, sex while married with another person who is not your spouse. Uh, you know, all those things are there, which are listed there, which gives the entire list. So, yeah, that is blatantly unscriptural and it's sin, right? So, and to answer the other question, the last question that you say, you asked, Romans 16, sorry, Romans 6 and Romans 12, talking, talking about presenting ourselves to God, which means, you know, presenting our bodies. Romans uh, 1 Corinthians 6 also talks about how our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not like a figurative thing, but it's literal, right? So our members of our body, our hands, our eyes, our feet, whatever, uh, you know, and our sense organs through which we receive the signals of seeing and hearing and so on. So the Bible says, present it to God as a righteous instrument of righteousness. Right? So, so that is also something that we need to do um, because uh, Romans 6 says, you know, you've been set free from sin and now you live for righteousness. And so you present your members as, uh, as in fact, it says as slaves of righteousness, right? Um, so that is the thing that when we say members of the body, we're talking about organs, we're talking about, you know, um, yeah, uh, sense organs and physical body parts and everything present to God as instruments of righteousness, right? In a practical way. Okay. Thank you. Right. Okay, so we see examples, you know, of people who lived a righteous life. Uh, Genesis thirty-nine talks about Joseph and how he, how he, how he said, you know, how can I sin against God when he was presented with temptation, when he was given choices, when he was invited to sin in a place where, well, uh, there was no one else around. It was just him and Potiphar's wife, but he, he was aware and accountable to God. He said, how can I do this against God? How can I sin against God? So, which means he was very aware of who God was and, and aware of who he was to God and that how he needs to be accountable to God, a sense of righteousness of God, right? So, um, so we see examples uh, like this in the scripture and we see the exhortation also that, you know, we need to walk in the spirit, led by the spirit of God. And that's the best part. Um, that verse that we saw just now, Galatians 5 says, um, 5.16, it says, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now, this life of walking in the spirit, right? 
as being led by the Spirit, prompted by the Spirit of God, is going to be a path of righteousness, right choices, right? putting to death the things of the flesh, living for consecration and holiness. So it's going to be that kind of a path the Holy Spirit is going to lead. Right? So this life is a life of worship. Right? This life is a life of worship. But the best part is this. This life is a victorious, overcoming life. Because the, it, it's very clear, Galatians 5 says that, you know, if you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So that's the key there. Saying, saying, if you walk in the, in the Spirit, if you walk prompted by, led by, empowered by the Holy Spirit, you shall not. It's a very categorical, you shall not. Right? So which means... Yeah. Will there be a struggle? Yes. Will there be opportunities? Yes. Will you be presented with invitations and choices? Yes. But if you choose, if you set your heart and mind and saying, I'm going to live as led by the Spirit of God, right? as prompted by the Spirit of God, then it very clearly says that it's a life of victory. Right? It's not a defeated life. It's a life of victory. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So when we say the lust of the flesh, you know, many times we think of, you know, probably sexual sin or things to do with our bodies and so on. But you know, lust of the flesh is also other things, right? If you look at that list, maybe we can we can look at that verse again, Galatians 5.16. It talks about um, attitudes, it talks about motives, it talks about actions, right? For example, if you see, you know, fornication, adultery, uncleanness, everything is things of the flesh, of a sexual, na sexual nature. Then you look at uh, verse 20, talks about idolatry, replacing God with something else, sorcery, getting into, you know, intentionally stepping into witchcraft and tapping into the powers of darkness and so on. Hatred. Now, that is something of the heart, right? A motive of the heart. Contention, loud quarreling, jealousy, which is again something to do with the heart. Something, to, you know, something that is not an act, but then it's something that's of the heart. Then what else? Outbursts of wrath or great anger. Okay. Then selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresy. So we see that hey, there are certain emotions which are mentioned there. Right? Wrath, which means great anger. Uh, jealousies, which is envy and maybe even covetousness and so on. So, so the motives of the heart. So these are also mentioned as the works of the flesh. So what is the flesh? Flesh, we can say, is you know the physical body. The Greek word soma is used there, the body. So the flesh is also the unrenewed part of us, you know, giving in to the appetites or the dictates of the flesh, which means giving into the dictates of the unrenewed part of us. Right? So, what is the Bible saying? If you live according to the Spirit, according to the Holy Spirit, if you are led by the Holy Spirit, you will not fulfill all those kind of demands. Sometimes it's like, wow, it's like a slave driver. I'm, I feel like I'm just a slave, I'm helpless. Right? But the good thing is this, you don't have to be, right? because Romans 6 talks about the fact that you are not a slave to sin. You are a slave to righteousness, right? We sin shall not have dominion over you. So the lies of the enemy are that you will always be a slave to sin. Works of the flesh, that you will always have that. You will never overcome it. That is the lie or the deception of the enemy. And as long as we buy into that lie, we will always be in that prison of the enemy. Right? We will always be in that place where we're saying, okay, I'm only human. And that's a great, and I think that's the worship song of the enemy. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm only human. As long as we say I'm only human, or others are also like me, we will never rise up. We will never overcome. Right? But in that situation, if we say, hey, sin cannot have dominion over me. right? Because I'm a child of God, and I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. The greater one lives in me. Right? I will put to death the things of the flesh, even as I'm led by the Holy Spirit. Then we will rise up and experience the victory. Right? In all these things that are listed down as the works of the 
flesh, right? It's not just the physical part of us, but it's also the emotional part of us, and it also some of the choices and the motives of our heart and mind, right? Okay. So third thing. Third thing is that when you can we talk about lifestyle of worship, we are also talking about a lifestyle of obedience, right? Obedience is a simple thing, but it's very complex when it comes to putting it to practice. Right? Um, I remember uh, when it comes to this this whole thing of living with you know living as led by the Spirit of God and obeying the Word of God and so on. Why do we disobey? Because we consider other choices. Yes or no? Yeah, we consider other choices and we say, okay, this is better. And I, I was, you know, I was told that uh, I heard this about this guy who was uh, this, for this game called handball, right? So, which means you have to hit it with your hand, the ball, you have to hit it with your hand. And it's a game between two people and you play it, right? So, so this guy, he, he did not have one hand. He had only one hand, right? You can hit with both hands, handball, this particular game. I, I don't know exactly what it's called, but, you know, they're playing this. And this guy became the winner. He won some tournaments and championships. He became the winner. So they're asking him, you know, how did you win? There are guys with two hands who are losing, right? They have an advantage, physical advantage, because, you know, to reach this side, now you have to dive and take that to reach the other side. Of course, you know, you. so they have a physical advantage. You don't. But how did you win? Okay. His answer was, I have no option. When the ball comes to me, I don't have to choose whether I have to hit with my left hand or right hand. I don't have to choose. There's only one choice. There's only one hand. That is what I have to use. Right? So it gives me no options. So how best can I play with this one choice that I have, one option that I have? That is how I won it. So I don't even lose that time, that fraction of second that people Think, okay, should I use my life, left? Should I use my right? I just normally, I just use whatever. This is the only hand I have, so I need to use it. And that's how I won. So victory, when it comes to obedience, it's like we, we don't consider other choices. Right? So that's the key to a life of obedience, where you say, hey, these are not choices for me. It's like the hand that is cut off. Right? These are not these choices are cut off. They are not part of me. I don't even entertain them. This is not a choice for me. Right? The Lord Jesus says, when it comes to love, when it comes to having a life of relationship, of love with Him, you know, He says, if you love me, John chapter 14 and verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Right? So, commandments of God, love of God, love for God, it's going together. He's saying, if you love me, your expression of love, you, you know, you're singing about love. Lord, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice and all that. The Lord is saying, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. So this expression of love for God is through keeping the commandments as we go through daily life. Right. So he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 21 says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So he's saying, you know, I will manifest myself. You know, when you have the love for God, and when you say, Lord, I want to keep your commandments, what does it mean to keep? Keep has this whole picture of nurturing, protecting, guarding, obeying. Right? The commandments of God, you know, when we forget it, we don't keep it. But when we remember, when we guard it and say, hey, this is a commandment of God, we nurture it, then we will keep it, we will obey it. Right? So he says, he who keeps my commandments, it is he who loves me. So he's saying, are you keeping? Do you want to see someone who loves me? That person who keeps the commands. It is he who loves me. And he says, I will love him. That love is going to be definitely reciprocal because he's, he loves um, you know, us regardless. But he also says that I will manifest myself. We will manifest ourselves. I will manifest myself to him, which means that I'm going to, I'm going to show myself. 
we're going to encounter God. We're going to experience God. And we're thinking of God, you know, I want to know your ways. I want to experience. I want to have an encounter with you. I want to hear your voice. He's saying, this is it. You know, you keep my commandments. You walk in my commands. That is an, that is an expression of, that is like a love song to the Lord. Now think of it. You're saying, no, I'm in worship, I'm singing this love song to Jesus, saying, God, I love you, and so on. When you keep, when we keep the commandments of God, it is as if we are singing a song of love and appreciation and adoration to God. Every time we do that, that is how it is. God says, he who keeps, he, he who keeps my commandments, it is he who loves me. So we are actually communicating that love to God through obeying the commandments. And so, so that's the thing. So it's a life of obedience. In other words, we see that um, obedience is uh, better than even you know, some of these sacrifices. You know, that's what uh, we see in First Samuel 15, right? Um, when and Saul, Samuel and Saul are having this, con con you know, this conversation, and Saul has actually kind of obeyed partly, right? He has obeyed only partly. Uh, he has disobeyed 50 per 50 percent. Um, and so Samuel says, you know, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? So very important question, right? Say, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of Rams. Okay, so it delights the heart of God when we actually obey Him. Right? Yeah, it delights the heart of God when we come before Him and, and worship Him with all our hearts, and He's seeking the worshiper. Right? The Lord Jesus said He's seeking the Father is seeking such who will worship in spirit and truth. So when it comes to worship in truth, this is it. This is it. How do we express that worshiping in truth? This is you know when we obey. When we obey God, when we obey His commandments, when we do it fully, it is an act of worship to God. Okay. Um, when we look at this verse in Proverbs, okay, Proverbs three and verse one says, "My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands." Okay, you see that? Proverbs three verse one: "My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart." Keep my commands, and then verse two talks about the the uh, the benefit of that. Let your heart keep my commands. So, which means let it be in your innermost being. Let your heart keep my commands. Now, we can actually obey in a manner which is very superficial, without our heart being involved in it. You know, we know that uh, in Bangalore, two wheelers. Have people who ride two wheelers have to wear helmets? Yes or no? Yes. So where is the helmet worn? On the head. <laughs> but sometimes we see it worn on the elbow, right? Sometimes we see it covering the petrol tank, protecting the tank rather than the head, right? We see it. Now, when they when they're at the you know, when they are there, and when they when they see the police coming. Maybe you're at a signal, and he's got his, you know, now it's the thing. Sometimes, you know, they have this notebook. I don't know what they're writing on it, right? On a small, small scribbling pad, and he's coming. You know, nowadays, you just bring the phone, and he's taking a picture, right? So he's scribbling. When he, when he comes, you know, the helmet is there. You just put it, right? You take it. So what is that? Is it the heart keeping the commandments? No. It's like, you know, I'm doing it when it's convenient, but I won't do it. When nobody is watching, right? When you say, "Okay, let our heart keep the commands," it means that whether people are watching or not, I will still obey because it's God who has spoken, God who has said. So I will still obey, whether people are watching, whether people are not watching, whether I'm in church, whether I'm with you know fellow believers or in a different environment. <laughs> where there are no believers around, I will still live the same kind of 
life. It will be a life of obedience, right? So, um, so these are some things. I'm sure there could be more, but these are some things that that make uh, or make up for this lifestyle of worship. Okay, so so worship we know. Uh, you know, all these expressions we see in the book of Psalms, you know, which involves singing, which involves, um, you know, all these physical expressions of clapping and raising of hands and, and all that is rooted in, uh, uh, you know, a place of relationship. We know that. But also we see that it's, it's far more. The scope of worship is far beyond all these, you know, personal and corporate expressions. It is part of our daily life how we live our daily life okay any questions or discussions before we close any thoughts so this brings us to the end of this course actually right so uh, next class we will see what uh, what other topics additional topics that we can you know uh, have uh, in line with that but then this actually technically brings us to the end of the course material that we are, you know, covering. So I just wanted to mention that. And also, uh, you know, we will, yeah. Um, yeah, Shani, go ahead. I just have a question. I know you went over the book, The Presence of God. So yeah. what chapters did you go over that? Is that going to be on the assessment or the quiz? That's what I wanted to find out. Yeah, so whatever we covered in that chapter about the presence of God, about entering into the presence of God and um, you know being the and and all those aspects of the measures or the different degrees of the presence of God. Yeah, those are things that um, whatever we covered, that's it. And uh, and the, that book you can actually read it to get an understanding, a better understanding of this whole subject of the presence of God. You know, for your personal um, you know personal edification and personal understanding, right? And what about the uh, the quiz or assessment? Are we going to have one? Yeah, we're going to have two actually. One uh, by uh, by end of November and one uh, end of October. So there'll be two two assessments. Uh, probably so, the yeah second one would be by mid November. Yeah. So you said so next. So this this is the end. Of the uh, this is, is this the end of the course? I mean, yeah. it's a class. So are we we're meeting next week? Yeah. So we will meet next week. And we will talk about some additional aspects of worship. Yeah. And then that'll be the last class, and basically. Um, yeah, we, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll plan that out, and I'll, um, I'll announce it. I'll post it on the chat. I mean, on the uh, classroom section. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Fine. Okay. So we'll, we'll stop here. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. We can address. Yeah. Pastor? Yeah. Yes, Pastor. Praise the Lord, Pastor. Yes, sir. Pastor, can you help me, please? Uh, Pastor, uh, the baby dedication, uh, 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 which scripture will uh, took the first Samuel 1, verse uh, 11? And, uh, 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 sorry, which one? Um, what, what did you talk about? Um, about the baby, yeah, baby dedication. Baby dedication? Yes, baby dedication, yeah. First Samuel. And the look, look to verse 20, uh, 22, 23. Okay. Past, yeah, uh, past slums. Um, okay, can I can I just address this? Uh, can you just email, please? I'll, I'll, I just want to understand your question a little better. Okay. You, can, uh, you can email me, and then um, we will address it. Um, yeah, since this is not part of the subject, you can just email, and I'll, I can... Address that, right? Yeah, thank you. Okay? Oh, okay, fine. Right, sure. Okay, we'll uh, we'll wind up. Thank you so much. God bless. Bye bye.